after this workshop, right? So there's not um, a, a big onboarding into this. It's very much something where the ideas are pretty simple. You can uh, you can get your feet wet, you can start trying, and then like anything, right, you iterate and you, you see what works and what doesn't work for your group. Um, and, and I hope that that's where we can, um, we can go with, with this workshop. So real quick, if we could, um, I put a Mentimeter survey in there. Um, if you can go to menti.com, enter that code, you can also use just the direct link um, just to get a quick um, understanding. And so the second question there is, is about teamwork. So um, what I'd like to do is just to get us thinking about collaboration and about teamwork and really thinking, so what are some aspects or some, you know, things that make collaboration work well? What do students have to do? What do we as collaborators have to do in order to collaborate well? And just to try to scope that a little bit, um, if you can think of words, verbs, adjectives that start with the letters T-E-A-M-W-O-R or K. And I will try to pull this up so that we can see it. Okay, so we got mainly high school, which is great. Got a couple middle school, no elementary. Can work down the elementary grades, um, but definitely I think some of the tools that we're gonna be using uh, work best with our, our middle school and high school students. All right, these are great. Yes, collaboration, communication, meeting often, being realistic, oh, I like that. Engaging, curious, manageable organized great work wonders love it rigor sorry i have to like angle getting a little bit of glare on my screen talking we need roles we need sharing everyone it's open okay this is fantastic so um but, but shouldn't collaboration start with a k <laughs> you know well because it, it's <laughs> there there are actually now that i'm reading through this there's a lot of <laughs> ones that, <laughs> okay could have been my instructions weren't as clear uh, we'll roll with it it was hard to go with that yeah 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 well, that's why i wasn't sure if i should use the word collaboration anyhow good fun okay cool well um yeah i'm certainly um optimistic and and really uh yeah i think this is going to really align with with those things that we we know um collaboration is is really challenging um, it is something that really needs to be explicitly taught. Um, one thing from working in a project-based learning school, um, we really get a lot of experience and, and understanding that, that need for scaffolding collaboration skills. And you can't just put students together in a team and expect them to work, right? So, um, so agile project management is a really nice framework for doing that. So um, just, a, just a, a little bit of um, a connection here to PBL. So as a project-based learning school, uh, we use a lot of resources from the uh, Buck Institute for Education, or BIE. And um, one of the things that we do in our, in our um, professional development is we look at this, we call it their gold standard PBL Danish. Um, and these are some of the, the essential project design elements that are required for a, a really good, um, effective project. And one that we've spent some time thinking about is authenticity. Uh, how can we make our projects feel more authentic for our students? And authenticity can certainly be like a real world problem that they're trying to solve, which I must say like your supercomputing challenge like nails that piece already, which is so cool. Um, but also when we're doing PBL all year long, a lot of times the, the context is gonna be made up, right? And, and that's okay when you're doing that sometimes. Um, but we really want to think about, can we give them tasks and tools and strategies from the real world that will um, help them have their projects be more authentic and therefore the learning process be more engaging. And so this is something I've been thinking about for a while. And um, I learned about this um, project management. Let me actually full screen this here. Um, I learned about this framework, which is called Agile. And Agile Project Management actually has its roots in manufacturing. Um, I think it was first kind of 
uh, brought up, and it, it, or at least the Kanban framework, was uh, to a Toyota manufacturing plant in the 70s. They call it lean manufacturing. Um, there's a lot of like terminology and vocabulary that they use in project management methodologies that um, I'll admit uh, can, can initially seem a bit pretentious, maybe it is, um, but at the same time, I think any time you get really in depth in a subject, right, you end up requiring a specific vocabulary to help you talk um, about that subject with other people in your field. And so project management is really no different. So I try to put that lens on it when I think about all the different language and the words that are thrown around. Um, I'll try not to use too much of it, but if I, if I ever do say anything and, and it's like, what does that mean in this context? Uh, please do uh, let me know. So one of them is, is what they call agile versus waterfall. And waterfall really is just kind of what you'd think of as your traditional project framework. Right, so you've got a really clear set of expectations or guidelines. Um, you know what your final product is going to look like, and you've got these sequential steps that you need to complete in order to get that project done. Agile is different. Agile is much more um, adaptable, right? And so uh, you can think about this if your final project product um, maybe maybe it's not static, maybe it's moving. Especially um, right, this really comes from the software industry where they're creating something for a client and maybe that client's needs are changing or maybe as they're adding features, they realize new opportunities or new problems. So Agile gives a little bit more um, flexibility to that. So um, here's a definition that we've got. What is Agile project management? Um, it's an iterative approach to managing software development projects that focus on continuous releases and incorporating customer feedback with every iteration. All right, so. Sounds great. How can we use it for our team? Um, and, and so this is certainly something that is used in industry and it also can be very effectively used within a classroom and with students. One thing that I like about it, so there's lots of, um, you know, we've got this methodology, Agile Project Management, and then within Agile Project Management, there's lots of different kind of domains or structures and uh, Kanban and Scrum are two of those. And um, you know, there are certainly people who will be very fervent and say like, no, you have to do it this way or you do it this way. But in general, and really in the industry, most project managers are using some combination of the different forms, right? They're picking and choosing what works best for their team. And um, I've got a couple of videos that I will show um, as we're going through this to introduce them. And one thing that I'll note about these videos that um, I really like, and I think the students uh, it works well with the students, especially the older students, is that these are videos that are created for industry, for people in careers. They're not videos created for education. And I think especially for the high, uh, high school students, right, that really resonates with them, right? You're kind of treating them like an adult by showing them this, this grown-up video or this industry video as opposed to just another kind of educational video. Um, and the way that um, I've, def you know, divided up Kanban and Scrum or the way that I find it's helpful to think about the two and the way that we'll talk about them today is uh, Kanban, I really think about the to-do list and the way that they structure that to-do list. And then Scrum is a little bit more of the structures for the team in terms of the team roles and meeting timelines and those kinds of things. Um, at the bottom I have here and at the end of this um, PowerPoint, I will share with you um, a whole bunch of curated resources, uh, but there are two that have recently been brought to my attention, although I'm not familiar with them inside and out, um, but EduScrum and Agile Classrooms are both organizations which are focused on taking these Agile project management and incorporating them into the classroom. And so they offer like multi-day professional development experiences and coaching on getting you um, into Scrum or into Kanban. Um, but like I said, I really think that after today, um, I'm hoping you can, you can go out and, and, and pick and choose the parts that'll work for you. And if you feel like you wanna dive deeper into it, you certainly, um, the people that I've met from those organizations are fantastic. Um, the one that's in the middle here, this Agile Coach, uh, that's Atlassian. And um, I have found their resources really useful. They're very much geared for industry, um, but I find taking those um, resources and then I can think about how do they apply in the context of my classroom. 
Okay. Um, so let's see. Okay, so I want to show you guys a short video. And um, I have it downloaded here so that I don't have to um, stream it, use up that precious bandwidth. Just going to be about a two minute video. Let me see here. There's a couple things in the chat. Okay, and if I could just, um, I'm actually not seeing anybody's pictures anymore, which is fine. Um, but when I start playing the video, if somebody could just let me know that they hear the audio, that would be great. We're just going to watch uh, the first two minutes of this. And it's going to introduce what Kanban is. Kanban is a work management system designed to help you visualize your work, limit work in progress, and maximize efficiency, which we call flow. Kanban is the Japanese word for visual signal. With so many of us working in services and technology, oftentimes our work is invisible or intangible. Kanban helps you visualize your work so you can understand it better, show it to others, and keep everyone on the same page. Most teams realize this benefit by building a Kanban board, filling it with Kanban cards, and setting up a work in progress limit. I'm Max. I'm a product marketing manager on Jira Software, and I'm naturally kind of a chaotic person. I seem to always find myself in fast-paced environments. I've been on really dysfunctional teams and in the past been in dysfunctional organizations. The number of times that I've seen Kanban kind of bring method to the madness to change the culture of the organization and just help me get work done has me basically shouting from the rooftops about Kanban. So I actually have a lot to say and I've broken this conversation up into a series of videos all here on our YouTube channel. So the first thing that I would ask is that you subscribe to the channel so you can hear this whole conversation play out. I want to show you something. One of my favorite things about Kanban is that Kanban starts with what you do now. This is actually one of the Kanban principles. Another being that Kanban respects current roles and responsibilities exactly the way that they are today. You simply apply the Kanban methodology to how you currently work. Another Kanban principle is that Kanban encourages hacks of leadership from all levels. It's on the team to work together to make Kanban work for you. Now, if those principles are something you can get excited about, then you might want to start by making a Kanban board. So this is what I want. All right. So I'm going to pause there very briefly. Um, and um, so just bring up, so this is again showing that idea of, of um, what is Kanban and this idea of it is a, it's a framework, but some of the things that really resonate, right? It, it, it's all about distributing some leadership, right? It gives everybody some ownership in, um, in pulling tasks that they're able to do and what they want to do. Um, but I guess I think it's probably appropriate to just jump into really the Kanban board because this is the tool um, that we can use really, really effectively. And, and if there's one thing that you take away from this, it, and it's super simple, um, using a Kanban board, um, I have found greatly just changes the way that uh, my students are able to collaborate together and keep track of large kind of complex projects. So let me, let's finish this video. To show you, it's a Kanban board that I built to visualize all the concepts we're covering in this video series. I just finished talking about the Kanban principles and it's important that I started on the right side of the board here. Kanban is a pull system, which means when you have bandwidth, you look to the left and pull cards from left to right. Since I have bandwidth now, I'm ready to start my discussion, Kanban boards. Kanban boards like this one can be built on walls, windows, whiteboards, or with a suite of digital tools like Trello and Jira. Their purpose is to categorize all the stages of work that a work item flows through from something you haven't started or something that's done. This is called a workflow. You'll notice that each stage in the workflow has its own column. And our workflow is super simple. Your workflow might be more complex, but I'd encourage you to start as simple as possible. You can always add more columns later. So for now, I'm done with this quick explanation of Kanban boards. I'm gonna take this card from something I'm doing to something that's done. Since I have bandwidth again, I'm ready to move a card from today into doing. Let's kick off our discussion of Kanban cards. All right. We're going to hold off a moment on our discussion of Kanban cards and um, 
talk a little bit more about the boards. So for Kanban boards, he says start simple. And honestly, the probably the simplest way you can do that or imagine it is just a simple to do doing done column. And this is the way that I usually use it in my classroom. Um, so this is works fantastic when you have um, a, a whiteboard with post it notes. Um, what I've heard teachers do as well is using a manila folder. Um, so because you can fold that up and the students notes all stay the same place. Uh, but also right there are digital tools that work. I've used Google Docs. I've used Google Slides. Um, and I always as a PBL school right will share lots of resources and a task list. So this wasn't a big stretch to just reorganize my task list into a to do doing and done column. Um, Padlet works for this as well, but this is one where I really, really encourage um, you to explore Trello. Trello was built for this. Um, it's free to use. It's relatively easy to use. Um, it's, it's, got a, it's, a, it's a rabbit hole as with anything, right? It's got all of these features and tools that you can, you can learn about using, but the basics are very, very simple and intuitive, and it really helps for distributed learning distributed collaboration, right? The tech companies have been doing distance work for a long time, and this is one of the tools that um, almost, you know, whether or not it's Trello or Jira or Miro or a few other softwares, um, this idea of a, of a digital to-do list or in a digital task board um, is really, really helpful in the industry. Okay, um, all right, so let's, let's first, um, we'll finish the video about the cards. And then I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit about how Trello uses, is useful for, for having those cards. For the agile software developers among us, cards should be a familiar concept. You can think of them as one Kanban card per user story. For the rest of us, we can just back up. You can think of Kanban cards as being work items. One card per work item. You wanna make cards for all the things you're working on, and place them in the appropriate stage of the workflow. Kanban cards should have a title and a description and an owner. You can also add any other helpful information like a due date. Then your card should start to gain a little bit of a history as your team leaves updates on the card as it moves from one stage of the workflow to the other. The Kanban card should be small enough that your team can make progress on them in a reasonable amount of time. You don't want them so large that it'll take you weeks to move the card forward. And you don't want them so small that it's literally every task that you're working on. Can you imagine how chaotic your board would be if it was every task your team was working on? You want to avoid that. Once you build a board and you fill it with cards, you'll start to realize one of the key benefits of Kanban. You'll see columns that start to bunch up revealing a bottleneck in your workflow. You'll also get a sense of what size cards your team can move forward in a timely manner. These efficiencies we like to call flow, and Kanban is built to help teams flow work better from the backlog to done. Once you understand flow, you can start to measure it. Kanban teams concern themselves with lead time, which is the time that it takes for a card to flow through your workflow from when you start working on it so when you're done, it's in the hands of the customer. And with that, I feel done with my conversations about lead time. And thanks to this board that I built, I actually know that I'm done. I have visual assurance that I've done all the things that I set out to do in this video. It's a good feeling. All right, so um, just a few more things to share and then we'll, we'll take a pause for questions. Um, all right, so in Trello, um, a couple of the features that I really like to use that I think are, are almost essential for us, especially now that we're in distance learning or if you're in distance learning. Um, so we've got our label, all right, just the title. That's what, what is the item on the to-do list. Uh, members is really helpful, right? So you can add a member and that makes it really clear for everybody in the group to know who's working on what. Uh, you've got a description and this is where, um, you know, as the teacher, I'll often set up my projects as just a series of cards, a to-do list column. And these will have 
um, where I you know, give a description a little bit more detailed about what's required for that task. Um, attachments, so I can link any resources, Google Docs, scaffolds, things like that. You can put due dates on them and the due dates change color depending on how close to the due date you are. Um, you can link, as I mentioned, Google Docs. And then there's a space for comments down here as well, so that um, if you're working on a task and you get stuck or you wanna share something with your team, you can write a comment within that task. And then it's easier for everybody that's on the team to see you know, the relevant comment or the relevant resource when they need it. Um, oops. And then the other big thing, as they mentioned, was work in progress limits. So um, a key aspect of Kanban is that if you have a to do, a doing, and a done column, really keeping that doing column limited. So limiting the amount of tasks that any one person assigns themselves at a, a given time. Um, and I usually say that that's one card per team member. So if I have teams of four, I want only four um, items, cards in that column. You can even set Trello so that it turns bright red if there's more cards than that in the doing column. And um, I really encourage students not to put anything in the done column until it's really finished, until it's shippable. Um, so if they're making a PowerPoint presentation, right, that means that um, if you have several cards for different slides, right, those slides are done. They've got their images, they've got their formatting complete, they've got their size, uh, sources, all of that um, before it moves out of the ongoing or the doing column into the done. Um, a few of the common lists that are used um, that are really helpful. So as I said, to do, doing, and done are like the essentials. You have to have those. Um, the quality control is a really nice one. Um, I think especially with remote work and student work, having a quality control so that when a student feels like their work is done, they can put it in that, that quality control column and have somebody else on their team put eyes on it to give them a little bit of feedback before they decide, yeah, this is finished and we're ready to move on. So I think that's a really nice one. Uh, blocked is a similar one. So if they're stuck for whatever reason and they need some help and they're not able to, to work forward, they can put something in the blocked column and maybe they can go and grab another task to start working on in the meantime until they can get some support on that. Um, and then a resources is useful if there's you know documents or things, links that they need to use frequently. Um, and then a project backlog. Backlog is used a lot in industry. Um, I haven't used it as much with my students, but I think for the context of your project, it certainly could be very useful. So a backlog is kind of like a, where you would keep your, your big ideas, your larger um, things that, that are um, for your project, but that haven't been chunked down into really actionable steps. So I might have create PowerPoint as a backlog item. But then my to-do items are really like slides one and two, introductory slide, slides three and four, you know, introduce some evidence slide. And so chunking those down from the backlog before the to-do column can be a really useful um, thing and a really useful skill to build up for students. But that's probably something I would introduce later on once students are a little bit more familiar with this. Okay. So rapid fire for quite a bit. Um, let's stop and uh, have a moment. Any questions come up as we were introducing uh, Kanban, framework, methodology, vocabulary, all that stuff. Um, Sean, I have a question. So yep. have you seen projects that have commonality? So you have basic framework of um, the types of things that start in the to-do list and, you know, and then they get replicated for either for your next classes that you give them the, what to, you know, how to frame it out, or you let the kids figure out what goes in those. Yeah. So, um, I, I definitely see the students. So, so in the context of PBL, right, I will, give all the students the same structure for their project. So the first one's coming to mind is, is a seventh grade geology project that we do where they create um, either a PowerPoint or a video or a virtual reality tour of a um, national park and talk about its geology. 
So they all have the same structures, right? Um, I've got a notes document, um, they've got their PowerPoint template, they've got all of those same resources, but they might get assigned a different national park. Mm -hmm. So all the research that they're doing and all of that is different, um, but the structures are the same and I can reuse that um, you know, each time I run the project. Is, um, and then uh, I think to, to add to that, so, so they get these cards that maybe have documents that I've linked to them. So some scaffold, like a graphic organizer. Um, but what I'll have teams do is they'll download that Google document or make a copy of it for their team and then re-upload it into the card itself so that the card that they have has the document that's relevant to their team, the working document. Does that answer your question, Paige? Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm just kind of thinking like... Um... For supercomputing challenge, we have certain, you know, things that need to be done. And so we would, we could have like a common language around those basic items, but then each, I could imagine each um, specific team would have their per personal project stuff. Oh, that's interesting. Cause like we have some deadlines, but then they have their own project um, yeah, and, and, work. So I'm going to have to think through that. Yeah, and you absolutely can. Um, so on your Trello boards, you can assign, you can color code them or assign due dates. Mm -hmm. So you might have a few like benchmarks on there that you've created and that are common among, you know, everyone um, with specific due dates and specific things that need to be completed by then. But then you can have either in the backlog or in the to-do list and just be more generic. Um, some of the ones that the students can edit and make more personal to their project. Right. Thanks. Cool. Classes that I teach is AP Computer Science Principles. Um, and this year, right, we were just getting ready. They have to do a big performance task, um, which is a program that they create. It's supposed to take them about 12 hours of class time. We dedicate three or four weeks to working on this. Um, there's tons of resources out there to help them complete it. And um, it's a really significant part of their AP grade. Um, so high stakes, you know, all that stuff. And, and, and we're rolling this out, you know, right when schools close down. Um, so I was really concerned, how do I scaffold all of these great resources that are out there um, to my students so that they can access the resources they need when they need them and not be overwhelmed with everything else that's out there. So um, I, I took a lot of these resources, right? There's this 57 page document they made by code.org, which is a, a lifesaver, but also a 57 page Google document. Um, there are videos from AP College Board, all kinds of resources shared by teachers. Um, and I put together a Kanban board. Um, and so this is an example of one that students were not doing this collaboratively, right? This was an individual project, um, but the way that I scaffolded this out was using all of these different cards in their to-do list and each student made a copy of their own and they worked their way through. Um, and I got really, really great feedback from my students that it helped them stay organized, it helped them use the resources. Um, and I was very proud of my students did really, really well on this assessment. So um, I think this was a, 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 you know, a really great way of introducing it. And um, this maybe is more in context for your classrooms and not the supercomputing challenge. Um, but I did like the idea of both scaffolding how um, agile project management is rolled out. So I'm planning this year to first give my students some individual assignments using Kanban boards before I give them a collaborative assignment, um, asking them to collaborate remotely, because obviously that comes with a lot more challenges. The other thing that I'll share is um, I don't only use this within my classroom. Um, I also use this in my professional life. And so I have a team of interns. Um, I live, I teach in Davis, so we have a big university there. So I have lots of interns who needed their internships, um, some of them needing internships in order to graduate and running into this problem of schools being closed and not being able to get the um, classroom experience that they need. So I've had, you know, by posting that I'm happy to accept remote interns, uh, we were able to, I got a team of four really great interns. Um, we used a Kanban board. Um, and this is how they were able to help me with giving feedback on student work, with scaffolding assignments, with um, creating all sorts kinds of stuff. So I use this as well um, for, for that. So um, a great, great methodology and framework. So let's see, we are at 35 minutes. My intention here was to give us a little bit of time to 
um, play around in Trello. Uh, as I had said, it's a pretty simple um, uh, program to use. And, but I'm a little bit concerned on the time. There's a couple more things that I wanted to share with you. And if we took 15 minutes right now, um, we would really run out of that time. So um, I think I'm gonna skip this for now and uh, keep talking at you. I'm sorry, I had kind of intended this to be a little bit of a break. Um, we're gonna skip this for now and we can come back to it after. But I guess really quickly what I'll share is this is not a project. Um, this is an icebreaker. So I think this one, I found it on their Trello website and it's like a, a zombie apocalypse. So, you know, what can you grab in your room in, in five minutes? Um, what supplies will you grab with you um, as the zombies come to take us over? And uh, it just gives students like a kind of a, you know, an opportunity to be, be silly, but also to learn the tool. Um, and in those breakout rooms, being able to chat with one another about, oh, hey, this is how you add a picture to your card, or here's how you upload a description or make comments. So I think this is a great thing to do um, for many of us who are gonna be in distance learning at the start of the year and concerned about how do we build that feeling of community in our classroom um, while we're in remote. So using a tool like Trello to do some kind of an interactive icebreaker, um, can be a nice tool for that and it's also getting them familiar with the tech tool that you can use uh, throughout the year so um does that sound good well we're gonna we're gonna keep on rolling so sean if you'd be willing um why don't you go through all those slides the content and those of us that want to stay on we can play with that super that sounds great and um i'll drop a link to this um i think it's it's linked right here in the slide which you all have um, but if you want the icebreaker as well, there's a quick link to that. Uh, you do just need to make a, um, actually I'll open it up really quick to show you the one different thing, um, which is, is not a big deal. So you have to make an account, you can sign it with Google, it asks you to verify your email address. Um, but to make a copy, instead of going file, make a copy like you normally would, um, it's hidden behind my Zoom windows. Oh, this one is very easy because it's a template. So it's got create board from template. Um, but another way to do it is if you were to have um, a board that was um, not a template. Um, so this is another example of a, a project that I've used with my seventh graders. Um, you can go to show menu. And then, oh, mine doesn't have it, obviously, because it's already mine. Oh, it's right here. More, and then copy board. So that's how you would make a copy of a board. Um, I can also make it a template. So I don't know if that's a new feature, one that I've overlooked before, but that would make it easier to share with students because um, then they could just make a copy. All right, let's jump back into Okay, great, how'd it go? <laughs> All right, um, so it can feel like it sometimes, you know, and, and, I, and I do definitely, I'm really mindful. Um, I work as a professional, uh, um, um, instructional coach as well, and, and asking teachers to learn new software in the midst of everything going on is often um, a, a, a big ask. Um, but this is one, Trello is certainly one where um, the bar is not too high, and I really think it pays dividends uh, to use it. This is also linked in um, the resources that I'll give you. Uh, it's a Trello board of Trello tips and tricks. So you can click on each of these and learn how to use Trello uh, and the different things. And they're scaffolded out by how comfortable you are with it. So Trello for Trello, very meta, but actually a really useful tool. Okay, so that's Kanban and the dynamic to-do list. Now let's get into Scrum and what Scrum is. Complex projects can lead to real headaches. Organizing the team, changes in scope, roles that aren't clear. But you can change that with Scrum. Agile framework. At its foundation, 
Scrum can be applied to any project or product development effort. Here's how it works. A product owner creates the product backlog, a prioritized wish list. During sprint planning, the team pulls a chunk from the top of that list and decides how to complete it. The team has a set time frame, the sprint, to complete their work. They meet in a daily scrum to keep the work moving forward. Along the way, the scrum master keeps the team focused. At the end of the sprint, the work should be potentially shippable. The team conducts a sprint review on the product and a retrospective on the process. Then, they choose the next chunk of the backlog and the cycle repeats. With Scrum, you can ensure the most valuable work has been completed by the time the project ends. Tackle your projects with Scrum. All right. Uh, okay, so, um, Let's talk about how we can implement Scrum or how we can take Scrum into our classroom. And the way that I, the, the, the pieces of Scrum that I find most useful, come on slide, there we go. Oh, I'm too far, way too far, there we go, um, are the roles. So Scrum roles, so we've got our product owner. And I tell student, my students, right, that product owner is me. Um, but for your students, it might be, you know, the designers or developers of the supercomputer challenge, right? And they've created a, a really clear um, either product backlog or a description of what the product is. Um, and then you have your development team. Those would be your students. Um, they're the ones who are going to be working on it. And one of the students, um, or this role can rotate as you are going through the project, is the scrum master. Um, and the Scrum Master is just a great name and title, and my students will always fight over who gets to be the Scrum Master, even if they do not want leadership responsibilities. And then I say, okay, you've nominated yourself. You are now uh, a team leader. Um, but I, what I really like about this is the mindset that the Scrum Master's main job as a team leader is not to do the most work. It's not to get the most items in the done column. Um, in fact, I always say the, the scrum master probably should have the least items in the done column. Their number one priority should be removing obstacles and barriers for their development team. So the scrum master is the one who, if somebody's having trouble with a resource or needs help debugging their code or anything like that, scrum master is the one who's gonna stop what they're working on to go and help their team so that the whole team can move forward. Uh, the Scrum Master is also going to be the one who's uh, facilitating the meetings that we're going to talk about in just a moment and making sure that that Trello board or whatever board they're using is up to date and current and, um, and all of those kinds of things. So um, if I find it very, very helpful to have a point person um, in my class, I might pull a number of my Scrum Masters together and have a little meeting with them so that they can go and share information um, with their teams. Um, so, so having that point person is really helpful and having these roles is really helpful because they're still flexible. Um, I've certainly tried all different roles in my PBL classes, be that, you know, a resource manager and a, a scribe and a question asker. And um, while I find those helpful in some tasks, I also find that it, the work tends to not be distributed evenly. Right? I don't want one of my students doing more of the critical thinking than the others. Um, so having these roles allows a little bit more flexibility in the team so that students can take tasks that they're either interested in or they feel confident in um, and distribute that work a little bit um, um, more effectively. Um, and then there are these, uh, they call them ceremonies, the scrum ceremonies, um, where you've got a couple really specific um, meetings and they have specific goals to them. So um, here are your four scrum ceremonies. You've got your sprint planning, your daily scrum, your sprint review, and your sprint re retrospective. Now I tend to not do sprint planning with my classes um, because the projects are, you know, they're three to five week long projects. Uh, but in the context of your computer supercomputing challenge, um, this definitely is something that I think you'd want to um, implement. 
And that's really where they're taking things from the project backlog and prioritizing what are we going to work on this week or this month. And then the uh, and then I'll go into the other ones. So we've got our daily stand up or the daily scrum. And um, if you're not meeting every day, like my classes are not, at least in the fall, um, it doesn't have to happen every day, but it should be happening regularly. And there's just three questions that I tell students to ask or to answer. And what I like in the daily stand up, uh, the idea in industry is they all stand up, everybody stands up, because these meetings should never take more than 15 minutes. Um, and standing up kind of gives you that incentive, like I need to work quick. Um, and I've read that even with remote work, they still recommend standing up for these meetings. Um, so it's just saying, what did you accomplish since the last meeting? What are you gonna work on today? And what obstacles or blockers are there? Really quick update, here's what we're working on, move on. Next, we've got our sprint review. So um, in the context of Scrum and industry, they tend, their sprints tend to be between a week and a month. You can definitely vary that depending on uh, your own needs. But uh, this is a chance for everybody to say, okay, what did we complete in the last sprint? Um, so this is a little bit more formal. Our daily scrums are happening every, you know, every time we meet. The sprint review is maybe happening every fourth time we meet or every sixth time. What did we complete in the last sprint? Uh, what tasks didn't get finished? Um, what tasks did? And do we need to add anything or reprioritize everything? Um, and then the retrospective. And for me, I love this because it is really getting students to be reflective on the process, right? And um, what worked, what didn't work, what can they commit to improving? Um, I'm, I'm a big um, subscriber to like the Dewey idea of students don't learn by doing, they learn by reflecting on what they've done. So this is giving them a really explicit time to do just that. Um, talking about their teamwork so they can improve their uh, collaboration moving forward. Okay, and then um, to kind of bring this home. So agile, it is not a prescribed methodology, right? It's a set of values and principles and represents a better way of organizing work and getting people to work together. Pick and choose which parts of which methodology will work for your team. Uh -huh. So a couple of the resources that I've uh, put together. Um, these three at the bottom are places where you can go for training, professional development. Um, but I've also put together this Wakelet here, um, which I have linked. Uh, if you're not familiar with Wakelet, it's a really cool extension and tool that um, I think is, uh, is, is really catching a lot of, uh, it's becoming very popular right now. Um, it's a great way of, um, I don't know it's like it's like putting your bookmarks together in a way that has some visuals and have some descriptions you can you can drop all kinds of resources in there whether they're links powerpoints notes um, but in here um, i've got the, the workshop um, a couple guides on getting started um, some example trello boards that you can use as team builders tips and tricks some of the boards that i've used before um, this is a more formal scrum board um, which we won't get into, but if you look at some of the resources above, uh, you can definitely um, learn a little bit more about the scrum board tends to be a bit more complex than just the to-do doing done columns. Um, useful, but again, I, 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 I encourage you to start simple and build from there. Um, and then, you know, it's a deep dive. So if you wanna get into it, there's, uh, there, there's lots of other um, resources that I found helpful um, posted for you there. And, I think that was the last thing I had. Um, so I do have a survey that I would love for people to take. Give me a little bit of feedback on this. Um, I'll drop the link in there in just a moment. Um, and then again, my uh, email is here. If you have questions, I'm always happy to chat. Um, project management. Um, I put a Twitter, Twitter handle on there because um, you know everybody at the CSTA conference was doing it. Um, I'm not super active on Twitter yet but it certainly feels like a, a great place to share resources. So I'm working on uh, getting more into that these days. So any, any questions? Um, you know, There's a lot, I just dropped a lot of words on you for 55 minutes.
I guess I have a question. Can you use Kanban without agile project management methodology? Like, I guess I'm confused. I understand Kanban, but I don't fully grasp the agile. Um, mm. So, so I think the way, and this probably gets a little bit into semantics more, but you know, it's, I think about agile is like the umbrella term. And then underneath what is considered agile is the different, more structured methodologies. Mm -hmm. So if you're using Kanban, that would be a type of agile project management. So uh, yeah, I, I think rolling out, trying Kanban first and just the to-do list is, is a fantastic way to start. And then if you want to introduce like the scrum roles, that would, could be a, a thing you add on later. Ah. So, so yeah, as I had mentioned, like Scrum has a little bit more um, formal of the uh, formalities and a little more structure into the way that they structure their to-do list and use their sprint backlogs and they measure velocity and they talk about some of these things. Um, so, uh, but, but to say that if you're not using all of those things and you're just using a Kanban board, that would still get at you're using an, um, an agile framework um, because students are able to pull tasks as they have the capacity to do that and the tasks that they're working on are visible to everybody else in their team in real time yeah okay that helps thank you great So, so Paige, is the plan to do, or if we decide, is the plan to have these kinds of trainings for our student kickoff it's, since it's probably going to be virtual or? Well, I think that's like a, a group decision. Uh, we wanted to first show this and then is there interest? And then if there is, then develop those resources like a workshop, um, you know, maybe pull Sean back in or, or even his students that have used it to do some peer mentoring. I, I just thought it like that, that blindsided Sean. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I love it. I love it. And I think I, I have a lot of students who would be, um, you know, excited to do uh -huh. that. And in fact, uh, my, my, our newly formed computer science honor society is still trying to figure uh -huh. out stuff to do, right? Oh. Service projects that they can do remotely. And that sounds... That sounds like, awesome. Peer mentoring for project management. Yeah. So, so, you know, I wanted to bring this to our community and say like, Hey, do we want this? And if we hear a yes, then we'll, we'll we will build that out. Um, so uh, your feedback would be really um, important in that uh, because it's not just us, you know, we're not at, in a point to mandate this. We just think it sounds like a, I think it sounds like a really good tool to start introducing to our students. Well, I think I agree in that, you know, I've always told my students, you know, hey, you need to do a group or, you know, now they would have to do a Microsoft team or, or what have you. Um, and it helps them share information, but it doesn't help them, it doesn't guide them in how they need to do the work and how to keep up on the work and how to make sure nothing falls through the cracks. and you know, that, that, that mindset for project actual planning rather than just fly by the seat of your pants, with, which a lot of my students do. So, yeah, um, which is something that they need to learn when they go out into the real world, whether it's virtually or not. So, exactly. Uh, I know Trello's big with your book. Um, yeah. With your, your book. Uh, and I haven't initiated it because I've always been in the classroom, but now it's like, okay, I think I'm going to have to do something more online. Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, if this can be helpful, then for sure. Go ahead, Chuck. Yeah. Two things I jump in with that. Um, first of all, if you're using, I heard you say you're using MS, uh, Microsoft Teams with your class and Teams has their own um, workflow board built into it. So it's basically Trello, but it just exists within the Teams. So um, that's certainly a really good resource. So it doesn't have to be one more thing for your students if they're already in Teams. Um, and then the other thing is, is, is yeah, absolutely like students develop it. How do you 
how do you get them to keep up on their work and not let things fall through the cracks, especially now that you're not looking over their shoulder at what they're doing. Um, and so I do believe that like the, those daily scrums and then having like the check-in meetings with all of the, one of the things that I'll do is I'll have all of my scrum masters meet with me in the hallway or in this case in a Zoom room and, um, and just check in with them to say, where are you in terms of your progress? So I don't have to pull the whole team aside I don't have to visit with every team. I get a quick update from the leaders. The leaders also hear where all of their classmates are at and it helps them realize like, oh, hey, we need to like get a move on. We're falling behind. So um, I have found that really useful as well. Interesting. And Wakelet's like kind of like Live Finder, isn't it? Is it kind of like Live Finder where you can create a virtual binder with all your stuff in it for one subject matter. Yeah, I think that's yeah. it, right? You get a couple okay. different wakelet pages. Yeah. Um, let's see, were there any other things that I needed to share with you? We got the wakelet. Um, the wakelet was put into the chat, I believe. Um, I dropped the survey in there. And again, if you, if you take a few minutes to, to complete that, that would be um, really, really helpful. Um, get your feedback, see how I can improve this. Um, if we meet again, or if you have questions or concerns about what it would look like rolling out in your, your context, I'd be happy to um, chat with you more about that. Thanks, Sean. Cool. Is anyone Thanks. interested in, in playing, if anyone's interested in playing around with the Trello board um, that, that icebreaker, um, I'm willing to stick around and try that. Yeah, I want to, I want to mess with it. Cool. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it'd be, it, it's again, it's just a kind of a goofy, silly icebreaker, um, but it gets you familiar with the tool. Um, I think it'd be helpful to do it in breakout rooms or even, I mean, you're not a big group. Um, but it's one of those things where it's like, Oh, I figured out how to do this thing. And I shared it with everybody rather than, going through all the little tutorials. I mean, there's a million tutorials out there, um, but I, I think you can learn as much by tinkering around for 10 minutes as you can from reading a half hour of tutorials. Yeah. Cool, all right. Well, um, thanks for the opportunity and, and, and invite me here to share with you. Um, I hope you did find it helpful and um, super cool stuff uh, that you're doing with the supercomputing challenge project. I was talking to Paige about that earlier. Um, what a fantastic project. So looking forward to, uh, to seeing what your students can, can put together this year as well. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Sean. Really appreciate it. I'm sure we'll be in touch in yeah. a couple ways. <laughs> Sounds great. All right, thank you everybody. Thank you. All right, I'm going to play around with this um, Trello icebreaker and um, let's see. Paging mm -hmm. together for competing websites so that the kids can have all the resources they need and, and kind of break down their projects to keep them on track. Is that what your goal is? That's what I was thinking, you know, like what if what if we set up, you know, the, the basics of the, um, you know, in the Trello board, the example that he had, like have deadlines. So like our macro deadlines and then kids make a copy of that and then they put in their specific, um, reason, like project. Reason. If we do a virtual kickoff, um, I always like the kickoffs because all the kids can get trained basically in NetLogo or Python or whatever we're going to do. In this case, it could be Trello or Scrum and Agile. Uh, right. and, then, and then I don't have to do it for everybody. <laughs> right. Do you know what I mean? Right. Uh, so they, they, they would just make a copy of the board and put their own project into it and follow the, the guidings on the board. Yeah. And 
or if we if my supercomputing students do learn this through virtual learning then when i do it in the classroom i've got if i do it in the classroom then there's helpers right okay. but this is this is a career readiness tool as far as i'm concerned um right something we we should be using and and that they would be using in the workforce like git and github so you know if they're going into computer science so yeah interesting any collaboration yeah any project that they have to do yeah but yeah, i hadn't thought of that as like a, a career readiness um but i agree well it's just learning more tools and then if they if they go someplace else you know if someone says oh like I, i'm not familiar with like we use slack and we've had we have used slack but i haven't really gotten into it very much um and i'm just starting to get into github so i'm not sure does github have something like this in it not that i'm aware of okay no. and so I'm, not, I'm not at all um uh, yesterday was the most i've ever spent in git in github so i mean i had an account for a class but i never i only posted stuff I, I yeah know. see to me github is more for the actual programs and they for pair programming or group programming on on one program uh, without having to email it back and forth that, that's right. that's what right. i see anyway and so i think that's a career readiness tool get in github if not career readiness college readiness if they're going to go on to college um because we know that's what they're using right um, and so any kind of tools where you know that maybe we would use that they should be expected to use when they go to college i think we should be considering well i think the whole project management thing i mean goes way, way beyond just what we're doing but in terms of just organization of any anything you're doing it's just you know the students even you know ourselves i'm sure you find are really bad with managing your time and organizing things and cycling through yeah. <laughs> so i think it's just a great uh template to help with that well yeah and then i mean with like my students it's like you have to meet with them all the time well have you done this no well then you need to get this done and, and if they can do it on a board and and organize it themselves so we're not pushing them pushing them pushing them you know to get it done they can see it all laid out what they have to do because they lose pick they lose grasp of what the final picture is once they get involved i guess what would uh, what's going to be hard for me to picture or to understand is like because supercomputing challenge is such a big project maybe how to break it up into those to do doing done tasks um because the doings are going to have like multiple parts of that um so if you guys have ideas um about it that will be really helpful to um to work through well one of the things well, i wonder if sorry one of the things that I thought about is twofold. When we have the New Mexico Supercomputing Challenge website, it always has the dates. What I think would be good is if you could click on it and say, add to my Google Calendar. Um, yeah. So it automatically adds to the calendar. And, or we could probably put in Trello, if we de decided to put something in Trello, we could have a board, like a, like a template board for you know, here's, you know, get your final evaluation ready, get your, get your final presentation ready. You know, you should have uh, your, um, um, not, um, trying to think the, the, the first thing, your interim report ready, and it could have auto automatically, it could have those to-do lists put in that they could copy and put into their Trellos. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just have all the main milestones already pre-set and then as far as their own project they have to figure out their own within it but if they have all the major milestones exactly um, and it looked like some of that stuff was color coded so maybe the interim report is a certain color and then you know the final report's a certain color that, that probably, could you know, be yeah that definitely could be And these are the kinds of things that they, you know, we deal with in, in advisory, how to stay organized. You know, it could be as simple as a student doing Trello for their work, for their classes, and they do, you know, they don't necessarily have to do, you know, they may have a project for another class that they could use, not just supercomputing. Um, and if they get used to using it, that's key. 
then they get better overall. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, you know, I'd be, um, if we think this is of interest and um, even beyond our smaller group, um, I'd be willing or to bring Sean back to kind of do a little bit deeper on any, any one of these components. I think you would definitely have to have, you know, like homework, go ahead and create a Trello account yeah. and, and be doing a hands-on project during, during the, um, during the training. Yeah. Right. And this is exactly what I asked him in the survey that he wanted us to fill in to, to uh, create more workshops with focus on each tool separately and slower pace. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I mean, part of it, 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 this was a new thing. I saw 10 minutes of, he did something for 10 minutes and, and this was the first that just like was, this is, these are the things that I do. He, the, he talked about Agile, Scrum and Trello, 10 minutes. <laughs> that would be, it was really fast, but it, it would like showed like, oh, there's something here. And so yeah. now we could even break it down into a session on Trello a session on Kanban, you know, and maybe even getting some um, like coaching on Scrum, like how to how to set that up effectively. Yeah, I'd have to learn more about Scrum. Um, I know when I was with the Forest Service, we did stand up meetings and safety meetings. Um, and I hadn't heard that at term in a while because we don't necessarily have them in teaching. We don't do stand-up meetings in teaching. You just kind of meet each other at the at the copy machine, right, or in the hallway. <laughs> that is, yeah. <laughs> <It's a duty. laughs> yeah, and then you, oh, well, let's have a meeting while we're here, but it's not a real official meeting, you know? Um, so I hadn't heard that in a while. Um, but j just to touch base, especially if you have, if we end up going back to a classroom and you've got this kid in this class and this kid in that class and you don't, or, and they don't see each other or you don't see them, we would have to have some sort of meeting, a stand up meeting at lunch or something. Yeah. Had you guys thought about, are you guys looking at doing a virtual um, kickoff? Yeah, we, we haven't um, figured out the exact details, but uh, it's either going to be October 3rd or 10th and it will be virtual. And what we're going to try and do is um, think about like possibly schools can be in session in small groups. And if that's the case, you could have like one or a few desktops or laptops in a school. And so the team can have a conversation, but they're in a meeting and listening to, um, uh, you know, some sort of workshop. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also gonna look into uh, hop in. Yolanda and I participated in the CS, oh, and Tracy, I think you were there, yeah. the CSTA uh, conference. I thought that was a really cool tool. It was uh, smooth and I can't see us, unfortunately, I can't see us almost, I, that was the first CSTA that I'd been to. And it was so smooth. I'd be like, well, why, why would you want to go to the problems of doing another one with hotel and travel and all that kind of stuff? I know, right? <laughs> um, it was a, I don't, uh, for the others that weren't in it, it was like this one package where you had like a main stage. And then on the left side, you could go to the keynote. You could go to the booths that were, and like interact with people that were from vendors. You could have a networking where you were randomly like had four minutes with somebody and you, there was something else, I can't remember, the sessions. And the sessions only went live during the scheduled times. And then it just was like, and then on the right hand side was a chat and that chat was either for the whole, like all 1800 participants or if you were in a session, it was just for the session. But it was always there. It was like, the, it was a very intuitive tool for a conference. Um, so there yeah. were maybe, um, you know, 20 sessions happening simultaneously and you could 
end up jumping into different ones if you didn't like it. And some of the sessions had 12 and some had 250. Yeah, participants, I should say. And it, it worked out well. So I would like to look into it. It's probably an expensive tool though. Yeah, JEA had something like it. And then I just sat through a uh, um, STEAM or arts integration um, for a few days and that was good too. Same thing. And I'm sitting here going, well, gosh, why, why do we want to travel anymore? I mean, other than, you know, having happy hour, you know what I mean? I, I got a lot out of it. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. All right. Well, um, I don't want to take too much more time, but uh, yeah, we are going uh, to virtual, but we're going to encourage teams to be physically next to each other, or we'll have to work on what that would look like because it's October. And, or it's like everyone's distributed and they're all in their own isolated homes or, or wherever. Um, and we will do a series of workshops for, similar to the in-person STI um, mm -hmm. and we'll have different tracks. Um, but I think there'll be a lot more choice because we don't have teachers that are needing to, you know, do management of their kids. <laughs> Um, but as we iterate on it, um, if you have ideas, um, uh, definitely feel free to share them with us. Um, you know, if you've seen things that have been working like that, hop in, you know, alert us to some things that are, seem to be working in the virtual space and that will be helpful. Okay, great. Thanks for this. Yeah, what's, thank you. What's, what's tomorrow afternoon? Tomorrow afternoon is just our own debrief and next steps. Um, so we have the morning, 9 to 12, finishing up the data science content and then a break. And then 1 to 2, just kind of bringing this, like the big ideas and, um, you know, what what do we want to help you? What help do you want as you move forward? Um, what resources should we put into place for um, student teams and for your own professional development? What's the theme this year for supercomputing? Um, it really, it, it's... I mean, we never have to do just what the theme is, but... Yeah, the themes have never been significantly um, impactful. <laughs> yeah. um, and we might not even have a keynote, you know. We'll see. We have some, those are some detailed decisions that we have to decide on. It seems like... Um, epidemics and epidemiology might be a natural fit and um, certainly the resources that uh, Dr. Scrace shared with us last week on the state modeling um, that was really interesting um, so those of you that weren't part of it um, there was what was called the SSI student summer institute but also science, uh, Summer Science Institute. And uh, it was just a series of kind of like brief talks, but the main one was about 25 minutes with Dr. Scrace. Um, and he shared what New Mexico uses to inform their um, computer models around um, the epidemic and decisions that they make. And that seemed really juicy. I think that's a great idea. Yeah. I didn't sit in on that. So um, I'm curious about the UW model that Dr. Birch keeps pushing out because it's right. more, it's, it's, uh, it's nicer. It's not as, uh, that's what they pointed out on the news that it's not, it's more favorable. The numbers seem to be more favorable and mm -hmm. not as impactful. And that one comes out of the UW and it's a model of the UW. Um, right. And, and I'd be curious to what maybe LANL has done, you know, versus UW or something. Well, they're being asked, you know, LANL is being asked by the governor to run all these models now. So, um, and they're going to make decisions about schools in particular around, yeah. you know, some of those models. But I know that, that, that LANL has been asked, I think there's like five or six scenarios they've been given or something, and they're supposed to run those models. Yeah. That'd be interesting. Shared, actually, it'd, be, so it'd be cool to hear from them. That would be very cool. Yeah. When it, so at, when H1N1 in 2008 or 9 
was big. So many projects were about epidemiology. <laughs> so we are anticipating that that's what's going to happen here again. Um, not that we need an overwhelming amount of them, but it just is like, it's so, um, it, it's Front of mind. hitting them. <laughs> yeah. What did you call it, Tracy? Front of mind. Front of mind. Yeah, for sure. Un unfortunately, I keep thinking that the kids are going to want to deal with something else. Um, cause this is, this has impacted their lives so much right. um, that, right. that I can actually see some of my people going, I don't want to do Corona and I don't want to do anything like it, you know? So and that's it's, fine just, for sure. That I, I, yeah. I, we've always had a variety and whenever we've done like, you know, themes, it, we rarely get projects. We rarely get like an, it, like an influx of like an overwhelming amount based on that theme. We were going to try and pivot a little into um, seeing how we could do more with data science, um, but we'll see. That's also more about, um, you know, using these tools in Python to do, get large data sets and pull them in. And uh, a student project four years ago, she pulled in all sorts of weather station data um, from around the country and cleaned it up and did some models with it. And so that was like uh, a little bit of an inspiration. She's not available to talk about her project. Um, that was Lillian Peterson, who also, you know, is going on to Harvard, run, won the Cutler Bella Prize. Like she's pretty, pretty superstar um, in lots of ways, but that project was an example of how data and data science tools could be used. I like the idea of showing an epidemiology model or models that discusses Corona because kids are familiar with it, at least just to show them, hey, computer science can be done with medical stuff, or yeah. you can use it for this, that, and the other. Um, right. You know, I, I always point out the, the models for weather because they see it all the time. Hey, did you know what they're talking about when there's a European model and an American model um, or what have you? But uh, I think what we did with uh, maybe not as much and not as in, in intense or quick, um, but what we did with um, the tables and cleaning up and Python, I thought would be good for our upper class. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I just want to add one thing, you know, our, our lives have changed in more than one ways with, with coronavirus, okay? Um, and there's so many different things that we could pull for a theme as far as how our lives have changed because our lives have changed and these kids' lives have changed and, and really nobody can, nobody knows some of the things that these kids are going through because it's just, you know, we're, we're all in our own lives in our own world of what's happened to us. Uh, these kids have their own dilemmas. I don't know, I, I think it would just be nice to open up to some of the things that have changed in their lives or, or different things and especially with this data collection the way we're doing it i mean just just think of, of a project of and let's go to the first thing that happened with the coronavirus it was a tissue with a toilet paper disappearing off the aisles you know and somebody was to do a project um how much toilet paper was out there or just you know something in reference to that yeah you know of, of what you know little things that changed their lives you know and now is everybody stocked up on toilet paper? You know, just whatever it might have been. That's just something that was happened first. But, you know, yeah. so many life changing scenarios have happened in yeah. each of our lives. Supply chain on meat, the supply chain on TP. Yeah. Right. I was thinking of a whole, they could do a whole thing on bats. Totally. You know, this came from that. Um, and then I was wondering about the whole permafrost. This isn't going to be the first. This is one of many. I mean, if we are, if through climate change, we end up with more permafrost melting and Arctic glaciers melting. What's in there? Viruses from long ago, you know, or bacteria from long ago. Interesting. Yeah, I, I, I think that these are great examples and I do think that kids are gonna have their own um, way of, of processing it and hopefully they process it through a, a really awesome project. Um, yeah. You know. yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for this. This was good. I like this. Okay. So we didn't I've do liked... Trello, but uh, we can do it some other time. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. I've liked everything so far. Good. Uh, good. Yeah. Yeah. I'll see you guys later. Yeah. All see right. you tomorrow. Bye.
Bye.